sheet of paper coming around. If you could put down your names, mainly because I, I, I'm more familiar with their, with their faces, but I still don't know names yet, so not very many. So if you could put down your names, so when you have a question, I could address you by name, okay? I'll get to know you better. Okay, all right. And last time, we didn't get a chance to finish up on eight, so I will finish it up this time. And let me see where we left off. Oh, by the way, um, I have your Scantron sheet, since all, a lot of you did very well. Um, I, it's very difficult for me to go over the questions, mean because there, there's an A paper and a B paper. So I will be in my office from 4 to 6, if you'd like to follow me to go to my office, which is in uh, business 3, 4, 5, from 4 to 6. You could come over and I could go over the questions with you and uh, your answers if you like, okay? But I know a lot of you did well, you probably, and it's not gonna be cum cumulative either for the final exam. <coughs> Let me see where I left off. Uh, let me see. We had all that. Uh, function of eggs, let me see. <coughs> I think, did, uh, is this where I left off? Do you remember? Did we talk about poached egg and all that? Yeah. We did. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is where I left off. I think we we're on the, the, the slide following that. Let me just take a look. <coughs> I think we we're on baked custard, I think. I think we will, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. We did this, right? So when you poach eggs, make sure, the most important thing to remember is that when you prepare anything with the eggs, the coagulation temperature is lower than any of the other foods probably you've studied this far. And why? Because remember I said egg white coagulates somewhere 140 degrees, somewhere there. Egg yolk coagulates at what? About 150, so about that. And if you have milk added to it, such as a custard, it raises to the coagul coagulation temperature raises to 180, so still below boiling. What is a boiling temperature? Too far. So it's still an old boy. By the time <coughs> you see it cooking, boiling, it's already too late. We had the lab already today. And it is extremely important when you cook eggs because it coagulates at such a low temperature. We have to remember this, okay? Not to overcook. Not to overcook. Okay. So this is why a lot of times when you go to a restaurant, sometimes a diner, a smaller restaurant for breakfast, and you see, I see my omelet already burned, brown, it's already overcooked. The best stage is to cook it until it coagulates at that temperature. So you really have to cook it below the boiling. And, uh, and we also talked about the fact that if you you know, it's um, when it's a very hot day, they say you could practically cook an egg on the sidewalk. Sure, because an egg white coagulates at 140 some degrees. Sure, you see the egg white already coagulating. Okay, let me see. Now I think we're on custard. I did talk about this, right? Okay, custard. Now we're talking about custard. In my lab today, we already did custard, and you'll be doing baked custard and stirred custard. The recipe is the same, the ingredients are the same. It's just the methodology that's different. Okay. Custard, <coughs> I mentioned to the class, it, uh, actually it's a very classic dessert. But in the United States they make it, uh, if you're a diet, quite a few are dietetic students, if you're dietetic students, you know, 
every hospital makes a lot of egg capsules because it's soft, easy to digest for patients who who are soft diet or soft diet, and it's just a very good, nutritious item for, for you to recuperate. So on every floor, usually there is some egg custard. Anyway, we'll be talking about egg custard today. It's basically <coughs> egg custard is uh, it's a mixture of either milk, sugar, and eggs, or milk and cream, sugar, and eggs. Uh, universally, there are so many different... Uh, you see, did I miss a... Yeah, is there, yeah okay. I thought I, there was another, another slide. Okay. Custard, every, just about every country has a recipe on egg custard. Can you name, we call it in America, just egg custard. In another country, do you know? Egg custard, another name for it. In Spanish, you know flan, very similar. And uh, what else? Creme brulee, which is French, except that they use uh, cream, or combination milk and cream, so it's quite rich. So egg custard basically is just milk, the way we make it here. Okay. But if you add cream to it, if you use cream, then it would be really creme brulee. Creme brulee. Of course, you brown it at the top, broil it, back, make it very attractive. <coughs> and, uh, and even in Asian um, desserts, somebody asked me after we made the egg custard, so is that the way that egg custard tart is made? Is that the egg custard? Exactly, yes. It's a, it, but of course, you could always add more sugar, add, put a little bit of cream to make it richer. So they all have their secret. Put some coconut in it, coconut egg custard, whatever. All kinds of desserts internationally. It's a very common dessert. And again, for the same reason, if they, if you were to just bake it like like itself, you're going to coagulate it because the temp baking temperature is too high. So if you were to bake it, you have to put it in what? A water bath. That's what we did. They have to <coughs> stay in water in a tray before to lower the temperature. So water acts as an insulator between heat and the internal temperature of the egg custard. Okay. Or for stirred custard, which we made this morning, you cook on top of the stove, but the temperature has to be very low. Who did stirred custard today? Okay. And did it was it there were two groups. One Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to work with you. Sometimes was not successful because I, I couldn't get to everybody, every group. And you just cannot take it to too high temperature. The minute it, it starts boiling, you know that it's curdled already. Maybe because it's gone up beyond the 180 some degrees. And there's another group. Was it Lawrence was it your group? Yeah. Well, you, you were able to make it. Uh, Am I correct? Oh, you didn't. There's another group. Are they here? Uh, They're group, not here. The group, my group did make it, but I, <coughs> but I, I, I was just working, I was overseeing how the, the stirred custard was doing. Oh. It ended okay. up being a little here. But there's another group. I don't think they're here. I don't see any familiar faces. But anyway, they were successful because I was practically watching them. Don't turn off the heat. This is all because, or you could cook it on top of the, you could use a double boiler. The problem is that we don't have very many double boilers good double boilers in the meal lab. There's only one that's glass, so you could do that. But then, yeah, it's just that it takes so long. And it took them approximately 40 minutes. So for you to make a successful stirred custard, the same recipe, same ingredients, one is baked <coughs> in custard cups in hot water and in the oven. The other one is just stirred custard. Just make sure that you have to have patience, time. You could, sure, you could do that. You could do that. But it might take it even a little longer. That's the only thing I just thought of caution. If you have one successful one, because patient gives up, you know, after a while. You say, well, let me speed it up, just get it done. And that's when the product would curdle. But anyway, it's, it, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a very good example to show the coagulation temperature of eggs. This is why we do what we do in, in the lab. 
Okay, let me see. Mm. Cuts. Yeah. Oh, uh, did we? Let me see. Um, did we talk about this last time? We did. Okay. We did today also. And but we didn't do scrambled eggs. I figured that as long as you keep the temperature low, there shouldn't be any problem. Hard cooked eggs, we did two. One was uh, cook a cookie, just done five minutes, and that was perfect egg. Beautiful egg, hard boiled egg. The other one was boiled for 45 minutes, and we opened it up. Sure enough, it has this fair sulfide. The green ring. Not only does it look ugly when you serve it to the guests, the guests will say this is, the guests already know, generally speaking, maybe not all the guests, we know that it's already overcooked. But not only that, it has this odor. Every time you have very sulfide, there's this sulfide odor to it. So we don't want to overcook our boiled egg. And that's what we demonstrated today. Okay. Eggs Benedict we already did, a holiday sauce we already did. And we did, uh, we did a poached egg today, two poached eggs. And they turned out well. Put a little bit of vinegar in the water. Um, and that in the instruction would tell you so that would collect the egg white so that you get a nice poached egg all collected together, not scattered on you. And um, I also brought in old egg and a uh, fresh egg. The fresh egg settled to the bottom of the, uh, the water and the aged egg was tilted up a little bit. It's not floating, it was not floating. By the time it's floating, you should throw it away, it's too old. It's tilted like this. So, and we <coughs> broke the eggs out of one on one plate, the other one on the other plate. You could see the fresh egg looked good, just standing out with the thick white and the thin white, whereas the old egg had only thin white spread all over the plate, and then the yolk, yolk already broke. So, it was a good demonstration of old egg and, uh, and fresh egg. Um, okay, I think, yeah, I do it, did this. So this is, the recipe <coughs> basically is very simple, one, one, and one. But generally speaking, we could add a little more eggs. It could be one and a half eggs to one cup, just to make sure it, uh, it gets gelled a little bit better at one tablespoon of sugar. But again, for fancy, my friend believe, any of the fancier egg custard, baked custard, you could add cream to it, it's even richer, you know. And I didn't get a chance to, this morning we were quite busy, but normally if you make a caramel sauce, which is very easy to make, melt regular sugar, put a little bit of water until it melts, then it's caramelized. So all you have to do, put a little bit of this, a dot of this at the bottom of the custard cup, the two labs, <coughs> and it gets a little bit solidified, you can see. And then put the egg mixture, egg and milk mixture in when it's congealed. Make sure it's cold. When, it, when it's hot, you turn it over, you know, you flip it over. What you do is that you just <coughs> run a knife around it and then just flip it over. Very easy to do. And then if you have a little bit of caramel, it looks great. You have the caramel just melting over it. And it should be cold. Today we were in a hurry to eat it, to taste it. So um, when it's warm, it tastes, mm, so it tastes like a dessert, not quite. But if you have caramel, it's a little bit more sweet and also it looks better. And if you wait until it's cold, it's even better. It's a very typical dessert. Now, you just serve it like that. When you serve it, so you flip it over, flip it over onto the, uh, the other side on the plate. You garnish it with some berries. Always garnish a plain dessert like that. But of course, if you have a caramel sauce, it's even more beautiful. Have some, uh, you know, blueberries, different colored. Always think about red and green, those two colors. Green is always a little bit of maybe mint or something because green and red next to each other enhances the, the egg, enhances the, the image of the color to, to to anybody because one enhances the other. Red 
becomes even redder, the green becomes even greener. And the vividly green and vividly red next to each other dresses up or garnishes the place better than anything else. So we always <coughs> say, if you have a platter of vegetables, make sure you think about that. Okay? How do you garnish? When you think about garnish, think of those two colors. The others could be yellow, could be orange, could be black olives on the relic tray, whatever. Because um, that's what is, makes the food look attractive on a platter. You wouldn't want to wear red and green together because everybody's going to be staring at you because they, you draw everybody. It, th those two colors would draw the attention, my attention, anybody's attention to that platter, and that's what you want. But if you wear that color, Christmas color, which is okay for Christmas, but on other days, everybody says, what are you doing? Wearing, I'm looking at you right away. You've got red, bright red, and bright green. You wouldn't want that. But on the platter, it's gorgeous. Okay. So that's how you would serve that. Okay. Flip it over, garnish. The next is uh, stirred custard. The same recipe. I mean, the same ingredients. But methodology is a little different. What it is, I so say you cook it on top of the double boiler. Or on top of the stove is okay, but it has to be very low flame. Never allow it to boil. Because you have to keep stirring with a wooden spoon. When it starts to coat it, then you know this, it's beginning to get done. It's, you, you, you're close to the final stage. <coughs> so, um, so keep stirring it while it's heated over low flame in a double boiler. Or today we did it in a regular saucepan. They want it really. The, the, result to uh, really well. And how do we serve that? Okay. This is stirred custard. So almost like the ice cream custard tastes really good. Okay. You could add a little bit of vanilla to it if you want. And what would be really good is that if you, if you serve it over a piece of um, plain cake, maybe angel food cake, sponge cake, or any plain cake, okay. or you could serve that, I, I love to put that over very fresh fruit and berries. Again, combination colors. If, if you have just strawberries, it's not enough. Or leave some of the strawberries with the stem, the green stem there will be good. A couple of them. That will happen the colors. And, uh, but what's really good is the custard. And everybody tells me, wow, you don't need anything else. Just fruit, it's just milk and eggs. That's a very, very healthy. And it tastes good healthy and looks good and nothing too rich. Okay. And you can do that. So, let me see. Anything else that's there that we forgot? And that's it. I think that finishes my lecture on, uh, on eggs. Okay. Any questions? It is uh, <coughs> a tennis sheet still coming around. Okay. Okay. I want to have it sometime. Yeah, so that I can address it by name. Are you Max? I already know you. Yeah. By the way, I'm glad you mentioned about fried egg. With, there's one precaution with fried egg. Did you know that I think ever since five years ago, maybe or eight years ago, in a hospital, you are no longer allowed to serve sunny side up. Because if you serve sunny side up, they're worried about salmonella. Okay. So in a hospital, you can serve fried egg, you've got to turn it over. Then they know that salmonella gets killed at what temperature? 165. 160 would do it, 165 to be sure. So you're bound to have killed salmonella with fried egg. 
in a hospital, in a hospital, because you're serving the sick and the weak and the elderly. You've got to be careful about that. Yeah. So what was the question? Did I answer your question? Not quite. I went off track. So if you're buying an egg, so you're basically overcooking the white? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're overcooking the white. You're right. Some people don't mind it as much. But when it comes to omelet and scrambled eggs, oh, yes. It's too dried already. No, it's a little rubbery. So it's too overcooked. And I could tell, a lot of people would be able to tell. So it has to be cooked until uh, it's cooked, coagulated, but still nice, soft, and moist. That's the stage that you serve. Okay, did I answer my, your question? Yeah. Often, if you don't ask questions, sometimes I, often when I go home, I realize that I get to tell students this or that, yeah. Okay, I think we've done with the eggs. And there will be uh, an online quiz on eggs. And um, there will be, I'm pretty sure, we'll get done with the other, I hope. Because otherwise we'll be behind. I think I'll get done with the other topic, principles, uh, principles of baking. Now we're done with milk and egg products. Uh, <clears throat> I've already tested you on, on milk, so from eggs on, we'll be on the final again. Okay? And now we're going to be going to all products, all the baked products, the general principles of preparing all of the baked products so that you have a, a, a good basic knowledge before you follow any other recipe. Okay, now, before we even start talking about baking, we need to know all the ingredients that go into a recipe. Okay. First of all, <coughs> we need to talk about the wheat kernel. The wheat kernel is what gives us the flour, whether it's all-purpose flour, bread flour, um, cake flour, whatever that you work with. Okay, so that's the, this is the kernel of the wheat. Let me take a look. And right in the middle is what we call the endosperm. The endosperm, endosperm is the uh, starchy part. So the more endosperm we have, the, the more starch we have or carbohydrate we have. And then we have the bran part, which is the outer color, the, out, the most outer layer <coughs> of the kernel is the bran. It's the bran that gives us the fiber. So it depends on what kind of flour it is. Sometimes they remove all of the bran and remove most of the germ. And all of the bran, all you get is starch, which will be the all-purpose flour inside. We'll talk about that. So. Bran gives you the flour, endosperm gives you the starch. That's where food is stored. Okay. And let's see, germ right here is a germ. Germ, of course, is the embryo <coughs> or the nucleus of <coughs> the wheat kernel. And that's where a new plant will uh, come from. And uh, <coughs> Generally speaking, it's removed, but sometimes it is there for purpose if it's, uh, uh, depends on what kind of flour we're using. Okay. Um, sometimes it's used just to sell as a germ, of course, and that's where you have more fat, and, uh, and also uh, that's where you have some of the nutrients also, because that's the nutrients of the kernel. Okay, and so whether it's a wheat kernel, or corn kernel, or rye kernel, whatever it is, this is basically the same structure. And by milling, by the milling, milling it, or removing it, the outside basically, you will be getting the inside flour. So approximately 60 
63 to 77% of the starch is the carbohydrate. The rest, there's some protein there we talk about. There's some fat, most of it's from the, from the germ, and some minerals and vitamins. The brand we get, the more bulk we get, and the better it is for us to eat, actually. Okay, now we're going to go into another part of wheat. Sometimes <coughs> we would refer a kernel to be a hard kernel or a soft kernel. The softness or the hardness of the kernel is how we classify them as being, <coughs> whether it has more protein or it has more starch. So soft wheat, generally speaking, is more powdery and be lower in protein. A hard wheat, generally speaking, will be higher in protein and lower in starch. So sometimes you call it either by hard, this is a hard wheat we're getting, we're harvesting, or this is soft wheat, and you know, whether you're getting more starch or you're getting more protein. <coughs> now, another thing is that by season, sometimes it's called winter kernel, and sometimes it's summer kernel. Oftentimes, winter kernel oftentimes could be hard, but not necessarily. So winter could be hard or soft, but it's just by season when they harvest it. So sometimes, more often winter you refer to as having something that's more hard, more protein, but not necessarily, so it's only by season. So sometimes it is confusing, but if you say it's hard wheat, then we know it has more protein. The soft wheat, then we know it has more carbohydrate. Now, we have all different kinds of flour. And the flour that we're most familiar with is all-purpose flour. And as well, you can see the picture up there, try to typically, sometimes people didn't realize that there's so many different kinds of flour, packages of flour. And one time, a lady asked me, I just noticed, do you know what, what is this? This says all purpose, and this says something else. Um, bread flour, what would you use? Often, sometimes they really don't know. Okay, so there are definite differences. Make sure you take a look at the package. If it says all purpose flour, it's a white. The white is like, you know, it, it is a type that you see majority of the time. But right next to it could be bread flour. So you might buy the wrong kind, which is what can happen to some consumers. All purpose flour is just white flour, no germ, and no bran. You have to know that. Basically, it's very pure starch. They remove the bran already, they remove the germ already. <clears throat> Let me see. I think I could project it better by this. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. Sorry, I didn't get it. So whole wheat flour is different. Whole wheat flour is the entire wheat kernel that's being used. So it has more fat content from the germ. Part of the germ is there. When the germ is included, that means it has more fat. So this is why later on I'll mention this also. For whole wheat flour, it's best for us to keep it in the refrigerator. And if you don't keep it in the refrigerator, if you keep it outside at room temperature after a few months, especially you go through summer, summer months, you go and you think that you have a package, brand new, you have never opened it, you open it, you smell that it's already started to rancid because of the high, higher fat content. Remember that. Bread flour, put it in the refrigerator. I, I mean, I'm sorry, whole wheat flour. Whole wheat flour. Bread flour, we talked about that, it's from hard wheat. It has more protein, higher percentage of protein. So the reason why we use it for bread, we call bread flour, is that it gives us 
your gluten, which we will talk about in a little while. I'm going to have to spend more time on the subject of gluten, why it is so important for bread. And uh, next is cake flour. Cake flour is it's from salt wheat. It feels very salt. It feels very satiny, like satin. It has very low protein content. And that would be perfect for making wedding cakes and cakes that are very tender because there's hardly any protein. So this is why it's called cake flour, specifically for making cakes. So you really should know the difference from one to another. Cake flour often comes in a box like this. Bread flour is labeled. Generally speaking, whole wheat flour is brownish to tell you that it has more of the wheat kernel, so it has more fat. Whole wheat flour, always store it in the refrigerator. Cake flour for cake. Pastry flour is almost identical to cake flour. They're almost identical. However, pastry flour often is purchased by manufacturers, companies that make pastry or make cake, so we, we, we can't buy them very easily. It's from soft wheat, also just like cake flour, but it's more for commercial use, commercial cake baking, pastry baking, and <laughs> baking, and cake making. So generally speaking, you don't have to worry about pastry flour because you don't see it in the supermarket, but those definitely you should know what they are, and how do you take care of them, how do you use them. Now, if you want to analyze it nutritionally speaking, I really don't want you to memorize all of that, but I have it here for you so that you can make a comparison for your own knowledge. For example, on protein, which flour has the most protein? We're, talk, we're comparing all-purpose flour, bread flour, whole wheat flour, cake flour. Forget about pastry, because it's almost like cake flour. So of those four, which flour has more protein? Which flour has more protein of these four? Hmm? Bread, bread flour? Okay, it's bread flour. Yeah, the reason why we need more protein, as I said later on, uh, when we talk about it, we need the gluten cell. We want it to stretch, you know, bread, you know how stretchy it gets, we we'll talk about that. When we talk on the subject of making um, yeast doughs and yeast breads. <clears throat> Which flour has the least amount of protein? Cake, yes. That's why cake, cake flour is used for cakes and paste because you want it to be, because cake, a typical wedding cake is so tender. You bite into it, there's no pressure at all and melts in your mouth. Okay, so it's so tender because it has so little protein. So it's, we select the right flour for the right purpose. Okay, now if you take a look at, uh, at the chart again, which one has the most fiber? The fiber that has the bran included, the whole kernel included, which one? Whole wheat. This is why, oh, since about, I would say 15 years ago, the popularity of whole wheat items has grown because they found the whole wheat baked goods are so much better than any baked goods made with the all-purpose flour because it gives you what? Fiber. And that's when they found, 20 years ago, they already found out fiber is good for you. But 15 years ago, they just promote that more and more. So we've had more whole wheat muffins actually demand they said for a period of time than any other. The others are just too, the rest of the, some of the muffins are just almost like cake. No substance at all, okay. So that's why ever since then, whole wheat muffins have been in great demand. All right, so what, uh, let me see. 
which flower has a little more according to the chart, according to the first three come whatever figures you have, which flower has more carbohydrate of the three, the top three that you have? Which one has more carbohydrate? Which one has more carbohydrate of the three? All wheat, bread, and all purpose. Or all purpose. But which one would have even more carbohydrate than even all purpose? But I don't have the numbers there. I didn't want you to remember all those numbers. Would be what? Wheat cake. Yeah, cake flour. So it's just like, I didn't give you all the figures here. I figured that you know that this would have more carbohydrate, right? <coughs> okay, so let's see, anything else that I need to comment here on this? Um, uh, pastry, when you're in the lab, be in the lab, you might want to take a look at the cake flour. Or when you, you take a little bit, just take a pinch of it and just rub against your two, maybe the thumb and the index finger, you'll see that it's very satiny. It's so smooth, okay, when it comes to all-purpose flour. Compare with whole wheat flour, of course, it'll be grainy. And bread flour also will uh, be more grainy than all-purpose. So there's a definite difference in the, with the feel also. So when you go shopping, you know what it's, you know what? Okay, we talked about protein, the importance of protein in flour. Now, if you take a look at the chart again, which one has more protein? Uh, you remember which one has more protein? Bread. Okay, bread. Okay. Now we talk about the protein itself. What, what does it look like? What does the protein look like? Eighty-five percent of the protein is the insoluble protein, not soluble. You put it in water, it doesn't get dissolved. In fact, it's very tough, very rubbery, and that's what's responsible for the volume and the texture. And if you were to break it down, and that's what we call the type of protein that's in the bread is gluten. Gluten. Now, uh, there are vegetarians in the world. A lot of people are vegetarians in the world. They cannot eat protein from meat. So what kind of protein would they eat? Hmm? Gluten. They eat the gluten from wheat. That's vegetarian. And especially Asians. Oh, they will make amazing gluten meats. They look, they, I don't know what even, one time, quite a few faculty members, and I went to China, we went to, we went to <coughs> quite a few cities. And I was, as the dean of the college said that I wanted to go to this particular restaurant, vegetarian. It's known worldwide. I said, okay. She said, it's pretty expensive, supposed to be very, very high end. I said, okay. Oh, that's when we were in yeah, Beijing. And uh, we went to this restaurant. Everybody was dressed as monks, you know. And the food was supposed to be all vegetarian, but you wouldn't know it. We ordered fish. And the fish came up actually just like a fish on the platter. It had fins. And believe it or not, when we tasted it, we thought it tasted like fish. The chicken came on the plate looking just like the, the drumstick or the breast. And we cut it up, we tasted it, and we thought that if they didn't tell us, we could have been mistaken as being real chicken. And when they do a good job, they really do a good job. And later on, we'll talk about it a little bit more. And how do you get the gluten, extract the gluten out to make it taste to make it look, yeah. How did they get the flavor? That's what we could not, and because you know what? Everybody says you eat with your eyes first. Now, if you blindfolded somebody, and then you gave a piece, gave her or him a piece of meat, 
that vegetarian meat. It could have been different. Honestly, it was more than, you know, it tasted like chicken or whatever it is. Who couldn't believe it? And they loved the stuff. The wind, you know, the, the fins, everything. Um, as I said, I'm sure they did something with the flavor to make it taste like, I know it's not me because we saw monks. Just beautiful waterfall and sceneries and all that. The service were all dressed in monks, you know. Beautiful restaurant, actually. But I, we all also wondered about the same question. Um, but honestly, we all thought they could pass as real meat. <coughs> but you had to go through some of the really good, I mean, I'm sure they, they specialized. It was written in the New York, New York Times, she told me. She, op she tore that shape out. The, this is this restaurant. That's what I wanted to do. So we did. Uh, that was part of my experience. So, uh, so it's a rubbery substance, tough and rubbery substance that's responsible for the body. So the, oh, are we here. Gluten. What is gluten? Gluten consists of glutenin and gliadin. They're very different. Glutenin is long and stringy, just like what you find in meat. And gliadin is a sticky stuff, syrupy stuff, <coughs> syrupy, sticky stuff. So you've got both of them together, gliadin and gluten together, and that's what gluten is. They bind each other together. But it's a vegetarian source of, of protein. So the long, tough, rubbery strands and the syrupy stuff that binds the mass together. And we're going to come back and talk about gluten whenever we have a chance when we talk about <coughs> yeast bread or something. The higher is the protein content, the greater is the potential to make gluten. So gluten development comes from this. And if you want to stretch it, you can stretch it. Okay. It does two things, actually. Okay. It requires moisture. Moisture. You have to apply water to it. You mix it together. You manipulate it together. And then you can stretch it. Stretch it like a rubber band. moisture and you need manipulation and this is how we make bread. That will be the last class on East Bread Making. So one thing amazing about the gluten strands is that it's plastic and elastic. So what's the difference between plastic and elastic? It's plastic because when you stretch it it changes shape. Just mm. like children's Play-Doh. You stretch it, it stays like that. Right? Am I correct? Does it go back? No, it stays like this. And it's also elastic, elastic, because when you stretch it, it goes back to its original shape. So it's elastic when pressure is removed, it goes back to its original shape. So it has both properties, plastic, and be elastic. And of course, we said that you need moisture to stretch it. You need moisture to develop such long strands okay, of gluten, which consists of glutenin and what else? There are two. Gliadin. Gliadin is sticky, glutenin is long. So that is the part that makes the, the product tough. So you have, it depends on how you're going to work with it. And uh, for the, as I said, for the vegetarians, they can wash all the starch out, keep just the gluten, they heat it, and they cook it. You go to monastery, the Asian monastery, a lot of monasteries. A lot of the monks are vegetarian. They eat only vegetarian gluten protein. The rest is all starch, of course, vegetables and all that. And 
they make their own meat from the, basically, the gluten. Because once they coagulate to cook it, it tastes like meat. And so, for what we're going to be talking about later on will be yeast bread. We need bread flour. Yeah. How, how easy is it to do? How easy is it to do? To make what? Gluten? Oh, uh, coming up, next slide, coming up. I, I knew that the target students would be interested in knowing. And we'll, we'll do it in the lab. Oh, we're going to make fake meat in lab? We're going to do gluten. Well, you're going to go through the process. It's a scientific thing, but, but you, could, you could use that, of course, to cook. Oh, you, for the Asians, you could go to the supermarket and buy them. Okay. Okay, so I just want to make sure. So, for, but for our purpose, for the yeast bread making class, the gluten part is very important because it develops long strands of the gluten. That's why we want to knead the bread. The more we knead, the more it stretches for yeast bread. And this is why it's very important for yeast bread for our purpose. But if you're interested in vegetarian diet, it's coming up. Okay. So this is what we could do, and I'd like to add that to, I know that they didn't do it before. Uh, I'd like to add that I'll tell uh, Emil also, uh, how you can make gluten ball. I'd like to start with bread flour, because there's more, more gluten for me, more protein. Let me watch my time by time. Use one cup of bread flour that has a strong gluten, and you put it in a bowl. We'll do it in the lab, Milo lab. If not, you could ask me, if you're not in my class, just ask a meal. Because, but I will I always talk to them before we do the lab. You slowly add half to three quarters cup of water to the flour. You knead and mix that. Knead and mix. You want to manipulate it until it forms a soft, rubbery ball of dough. Allow it to sit because it needs to absorb more water for about 10 minutes. And in the sink, now you've got protein and you have starch. You don't want the starch. You don't want the carbohydrate. You just want the protein, right, to, to mimic the, the meat that we're talking about. Okay. So in the sink, uh, protein. rid of the starch. How do you get rid of the starch? You've got a, a mass of the dough, sticky. Okay, you want to remove the starch. All you have to do is to put it in the sink and you run cold water to it, to the dough ball, cold water. And you see the milky, starchy water that comes out because you want to keep the protein. You want to let go of the starchy water. See, eventually, you see, you could basically pick it up as a gluten ball already, water turns milky as the starch gets washed away. You wash more, wash until the water is completely clear. If the water is completely clear, then all the starch is gone, right? Now the dough is very gummy. You're ready, pretty much. And of course, the Asians will cook this. They often will fry it or saute it, uh, cook it high protein. You could cook it. And once you fry a little bit or brown a little bit, and you cook this with vegetables, that's what they do. And they eat this as if normally this is what you eat, what, what the monks eat. But of course, if they want to go to a fancy restaurant, they, that's the part I wouldn't know how they did. That's it. That they could make this into something that looks like meat. Looks like, especially chicken and fish, they said. Do they just have a mold? Hmm? Do they just have a mold? Uh, I, I'm sure they use a mold, but how do you make the taste? I mean, as I said, if you blindfold it, you'll you be surprised how similar it tastes like fish. What kind of flavor do they put in to, to add to it? I have no idea. Well, sauce that covers it, I don't know. But all that's all that I remember. There were about five of us who had this meal. We all said, we were all marveled at this, but of course, it was different. I wish I had photos to show you. But this is what you would find in an Asian food market. You could sell, they sell this. And then that's for the vegetarian. Yeah. And then, um, what kind of protein do you put in that? Oh, 
I don't think they could wash out all of the starch. The more water you get to run it through or to wash it with, the more starch gets washed away. But of course, this is the part. This is basically mostly protein. The more you wash, I think the more starch gets washed away. Like 95% protein? Yeah, I, 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 that's my pure guess. I, I never analyzed it. It would be good. Like in your experiment, experimental foods class, if you could, if there's a way you could analyze starch versus protein, then you could get a percentage of this. And how long do you have to wash to get to 90% or 80% or is it possible or something? Yeah. But you know, one thing though you have to be cautious about, this is vegetarian vegetarian source of protein. This is perfectly okay. My recommendation, this is perfectly okay for adults. We're already full grown. For children, you've got to be very cautious. Okay. Milk is still the best source. Eggs is still the best source of protein. Okay. With a complete biological value. And this is why there's a big difference. Okay, sometimes in countries like India, or maybe in any part of Asia, they put everybody on vegetarian diet because animal protein may not be as available. They may not give them as much milk or whatever. They tell them when they're growing, you want them to be nice and tall. Because certain areas of India, they are much shorter. There's a difference between animal protein diet and vegetarian protein diet. At our age, the more of this, the better, right? We don't need any more. That's the way I see it. Okay, any more questions? I can talk for everyone. Diets and all that. <clears throat> so now we'll go through the other ingredients that we use. Let me see my time is I'm good on time. So before we start baking, we want to talk about all we talked about uh, flour, the use of flour in the starch. And now what else do we need? Uh, when we Sugar, uh, to need sugar, depends because a lot of it's sweet, sweet items. Table sugar, sucrose, everybody knows that diet, Zacharias, right? It's high in calories, basically no fiber, no, no vitamins, right? But it has calories. One ounce gives you about 100 calories. So if you eat a lot of sugar, it's, uh, it's too many calories probably when we eat a lot of desserts. <clears throat> so why do we use sugar in baking? First of all, it gives you the flavor. Sweetness, it give you the taste, and that's why we include sugar in baked, baked goods. Another role, important role, is that which you might not notice, is that it gives a very nice browning effect. It's remember when we had the browning effect with apples and potatoes when you expose it to air, so you don't add acid. Okay, this is. That was enzymatic, because the enzyme in the apples, the enzyme in the bananas turn up. But this is non-enzymatic browning. So sugar also browns, gives you a very nice color to when you serve dessert or serve whatever it is. Sugar and protein together forms a Maillard reaction, non-enzymatic, not like the one we did. So it gives you a nice crust color. And when you have to, when you toast bread, it's nicely toasted. The browning is nice because it, there's bound to be a little bit of sugar in there or carbohydrate, <clears throat> and uh, and the protein together gives a little bit of browning. And even condensed milk. Remember we talked about evaporated milk. Now condensed milk, there's sugar in it. So if you get a can of condensed milk and you just put it in boiling water and just let it. Let it cook. Let it cook for about an hour, half an hour, an hour. You open up. Anybody try that? You open it up. It's beautifully brown. Well, at the start of the process, it was, it was just milk and sugar. It was the evaporated milk and sugar. How did it turn brown? It's the effect of sugar. So some of the South, Southeast Asians use that for dessert. 
very nice. It's like caramelized sugar, caramelized milk, and it tastes good. And the other important function of sugar is that it has a tenderizing effect. Because sugar absorbs water. You know, remember we said gluten development, these two things, two processes. One, the gluten needs water. Two, in order for it to develop, it needs manip manipulation. Okay. Sugar has a natural tendency to absorb the water. It picks up the water, okay, so it's going to slow down the gluten development. So it tenderizes it. That means the gluten does not get developed. How many of you have tried making cookies with no sugar? You know, in experimental foods, a lot of the students wanted to try making cookies with no sugar. So they use what? Saccharin or artificial sweetening. You try that. I tell you, do you like it? Make a guess. Why would it not work? It would not work for two reasons. One, the color is going to be bad. No browning. This does not occur. Another reason that it would not work is that it's tough. Oh, the cookies. You tried it. That's why they said, you know, they tried for all kinds of you. You, you were nodding your head. So I thought maybe you tried. You know, did you know that for a while, which company was that? Sara Lee made a lot of no sugar dessert. However, was it successful? Initially, everybody wanted to, to buy it. No sugar, non-sugar dessert. Everybody wanted to buy this cookie, so after what did not sell. No matter what, it's missing these two, especially when you make cookies. It's hard. It's, just, it's not tender, and it doesn't brown. So sugar has had a very important function in desserts, even though we know it's not good for you. Okay, now we talked about sugar. Oh, also, yeah, sugar is very important in the creaming function. They don't will be talking about cake making. There's a creaming process that you beat the fat <clears throat> with gradual addition of sugar. So the, that as you add more sugar, it gets more cre creamy. It gets it incorporates more air. Finally, you have this big mass of creamed sugar with fat that has air actually incorporated into it. So also, this also is an important thing. So if you want to make cake without sugar, you're missing this off. It's not going to be easy for you for many reasons. Okay, so this is why nobody wants to have sugar. It doesn't do anything good for you, but it's great in terms of, of its properties, that what it does, sugar. Now let's take a look when we bake. How about the function of fat? Do we need fat? Unfortunately, we do. If you want to make a good dessert. Oh, sorry. Fat, remember I said those gluten strands are very tough. Sugar fights for the water and basically prevents it from stretching, so, so it tenderizes it. Fat okay, shortens the gluten strand because fat gets in there. It shortens it. Basically, it cuts it up, does not allow it to stretch too much. So, has anybody tried to make cookies with no fat? Well, again, I Don't put any fat in. You're biting to it. It is so hard. You don't want to take another bite or another cookie if there's no fat, unfortunately. Because what it does is that it shortens the gluten strand, so it tenderizes it. So you've got all these gluten strands, long and tough, remember? It's that rubber band, and it shortens it. So the more fat you have, the more tender is the cookie. In fact, 
many times, my friends have said, oh, Jana, do you have to taste these cookies that my, my friend made? Oh, I said, it looks really good. It's delicious. Just take a bite. Okay. They said, just take a bite. I said, how good is it? Oh, it practically melts in your mouth. Then I know right away, and I would tell my friend, I bet you it has a lot of fat. Let me see. Does it have a lot of fat in the recipe? Oh, yeah, how would you know? So how would you know? And that's what fat does. The more fat you put in, the more tenderizing it is. It's, it melts in your mouth, the cookie. It tastes so good. All the cookies, so that's a lot of butter, a lot of fat. That's what it does. <coughs> so if you want to make a successful cookie that everybody, consumers, would like to buy or taste, you have to add some fat, unfortunately. So, but also it provides flavor. We talked about that before. Oh, some of the flavors are fat soluble. It gives flavor and it gives a lot of calories. Somebody who wants to increase weight, one tablespoon. Okay, we talked about that. It has calories. It, so it, <coughs> when you have fat in the baked product, it increases moisture, richness, and tenderness. Unfortunately, with dietitians, always there's always a tendency for you to cut corner on fat. Everybody does that, and I do it. Later on, we'll talk about pastry making. It's supposed to be one third of it is fat. Sure, <coughs> I'll take a bag a little bit, even a little bit, even a little bit. Still, I hope I could reach the limit that people can't tell the difference, you know. Still tastes good, and yet it's reduced calories. It's a challenge. <coughs> okay, different types of fat. We already talked about that, but let's summarize a little bit what the different fats uh, do to a baked product. First of all, in the olden days, we had lard. That's all we had. Solid fat was lard. And they said that, that's why they said the old-fashioned pastry, old-fashioned pies are the very, very best. Because yes, lard is the best fat as a shortening agent. It is so tender, they said, the old-fashioned pie crust. It's the best because it was made with lard. So what is lard? Pork fat. And it's very plastic. It gives great flakiness because it's solid fat. And it's able to give us the flakiness, layers and layers of fat. But of course, it also gives you flavor, pork fat. But we don't want to use it anymore. It, we, in fact, can no longer find, I can no longer find lard in the grocery store. Can you? No. They basically removed it because nobody wants to buy it anymore. It's really bad fat. Can you imagine pork fat? Just like steak in the olden days. You know, men used to eat steak, especially they said the best part is the surface fat and not knowing what, what they were eating. I'm talking about 50 years ago, 60 years ago, even 100 years ago, that's all that they knew. And lard, you know. So, no longer, of course, can you buy pork fat. And also, it gets rancid very easily because it's a natural animal fat. And it's a saturated fat, and it's so bad for you, as you know. But of course, the other choice would be oil. Oil would be vegetable. And that they've been using for a long time, oil. Oil has more shortening power. <clears throat> what it is, it, it coats the gluten strand. It coats it to prevent the gluten from developing. That means no matter how much you stretch it, like when you make, make a yeast bread, if you put a lot of oil there, it prevents it from stretching. So gluten, the reason it's tough, the gluten strands are tough is because they get aligned one after one sheet after the other. And sugar will cut it up, oil will cut it up. 
what it is, is that it coats it, it prevents it from forming very strong strands. So oil is great, it breaks it up very quickly. It's great for fine textured goods, such as chiffon cakes. They just use oil. They bite into this hardly anything, any substance to it. And sometimes muffin, they sometimes use it for, for muffins. It's very, very soft and uh, light. You know, you bite into this, you don't think, you, because the oil has basically cut up all of the gluten strands in, in, in <coughs> flour. So, tremendous shortening powers. So, none of these basically worked, right, before. So, human beings were, we were trying to find a compromise. What do we do? We want a fat that will give us layers of flat, sheets of fat like this to separate gluten strands. And we still want it to be tender. So they thought, well, and also still wanted to be healthy. So this is why they came up with all-purpose fat, which is hydrogenated fat. We still use the hydrogenated Crisco, typically. You still find it. There's no substitute for Crisco, by the way. Shortening. When you make pie crust, you could use butter or you could use shortening. Which one did you want? Butter has saturated fat. Shortening has, has trans fat. Remember, we always, I don't need to repeat that. So that's why they invented all-purpose fat, such as shortening. It looks like lard. It functions like lard, but it's not bad as, as lard. So everybody was, was so happy. Not only that, it could withstand very high frying temperature. So you could deep fat fry um, anything you want. That's why, as I said, McDonald's french fries, nice and crispy. Uh, you use it for pastry, it was fantastic, it was wonderful. They thought they had the best item they ever could until, I would say about 15 years ago, trans fat was found to be bad for you. It could be just as bad as saturated fat. So, but they, there's still no substitute. As I said, if there's a food chemist who could come up with the material, an item that's good for you, not trans fat, not lard, and that's still semi-solid. We need the semi-solid or solid fat to give us sheets of layers of flakiness in a lot of products. We talk about biscuits and pie crust and pastry and all that. We just can't can't find it. So now they still we still use hydrogenated fat. Uh, my daughter's actually, you know, she has a lot of apples. Apple small why don't you make some apple pies? Because we use it every year I do. So I made, she made five, and I made three. Again, for this thing, what kind of fat do I use? Always a dilemma. Nothing is good. Uh, so the only one, label when we talk about pastry, you could, might as well just use half butter and half shortening. But you need solid fat. I wouldn't use lard, so it's always a dilemma. good or flavor and you could combine butter with shortening for pastry because then you get the good taste to it. The best thing is not to eat it, right? We, we froze them because she froze them for Christmas, I froze them for, for Thanksgiving. They're coming over to, to our house for Thanksgiving, we're going over there for Christmas. So I only made three, she made five. Uh, five. Apple pies because she didn't want to throw it. But if you, it's always difficult. Okay. Butter, I suggest that we use half butter. And they go, when we talk about pastry, that's what they suggest. Half butter and half short. Either way, that's what's going to be, it's going to be bad for you. So just don't eat too much. Mar 
margarine, very, very similar to butter. Again, margarine is for the same. Well, we, I already talked about that, trans fat, because margarine started with what? Vegetable oil, and hydrogenated, so it's trans fat. So now there's no, the stick form of margarine is not available. They have to make it much softer, I said, in a tub. But it doesn't function like butter either. So none of the efforts thus far have been successful in making food that tastes just as good and a different product that's also good for your health, unfortunately. The rest, let's see. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Okay, we need liquid, of course. <coughs> we talked about flour. We talked about fat. Liquid. Remember, as I said, you need the liquid to hydrate the flour. You need liquid to develop the gluten. We already talked about that. And you need liquid to gelatinize the, uh, the starch, which we talked about, which is self-explanatory, right? Salt, you sometimes wonder, why do we put a little bit of salt? Salt actually heightens flavor. If you don't put any salt in it, it's not going to be, everybody asks, why do you put salt? The recipe, why did the recipe ask for salt? It heightens the flavor. Add just a little bit. You're not going to taste anything but salty. It heightens the flavor. And also, when we talk about yeast bread making, it controls yeast growth. And uh, we talk about and, and kind of control the yeast so that they don't go too, too fast. Okay. The next is leavening agents. I think timing is just right. Leavening agent and gas forming. <clears throat> What's leavening agent? What do we mean when we say leavening agent? You know the meaning of leavening agent? Leavening agent causes a product, baked product, to what? To rise, yes. So it'll be porous so that it's tender. Uh, so it's kind of like expansion of the dough. The lighter it is, the better it is. The mouth feels also a lot better. Okay. So we increase the volume by putting leavening agent to any product. And make, makes the product much lighter, otherwise the product will be very compact and not edible. So what are some of the leavening agents that we use in baking? First of all, air. I'm bound to test you on these. I'll give you what I'll do in the final exam. I'll give you a, a number of uh, products. Pastry, cake making, uh, uh, popover making. But we have not done these yet. Later you'll know it all. And I will ask you which leavening, what is the main leavening agent in those products? By the time we finish it all, you'll know it. Air. How do we introduce air to a product so that it's used as a leavening agent so it rises? Sifting of flour. This is why we said at the very beginning, the first thing we do is to sift the flour. When a recipe does not tell you whether you need to sift or not, you, they assume you know you sift it once. Put it <coughs> onto, remember we talked about on a piece of paper, and then you spoon it, always sift the flour. When you sift it, you introduce air. Your product will be lighter because you've got air introduced during the sifting process. And also, in the creaming process, when we make cake, we always cream the butter or the shortening. During the creaming process, we add sugar to it. As you add sugar, the mass becomes larger and larger because you introduce more and more air. You've got this little bit of fat or butter, and as you introduce sugar to it, it becomes this big, this big, and it fills up almost half of a bowl of this, and most of it's air. The larger is the mass, the better it is. That means the more air you have beaten into it. So that's air, using air as leavening agent. The second leavening agent is steam. Where 
do we get steam? How do we get steam? Steam from what? Water. From water, yeah. Once we bake something in the oven, any liquid will turn into steam. When it turns into steam, the product rises. So the typical product will be popover. We'll be making popovers in a meal of that. When you make it, you steam because there's quite a bit of water in it. So the water will get heated up and it's just like it explodes, you see it. If you have an oven that has a glass window, you see it. So you see the volume popover comes about three times as big as the original volume. So steam can be used as a leavening agent. The third one is carbon dioxide, which is one of the gases. So carbon dioxide, where do we get carbon dioxide? Do you know? How do we put carbon dioxide into a baked product? So the air comes up. Do you know where do we get carbon dioxide? Good, baking soda and baking powder. Good, we'll be talking about those two. Okay, so in quick breads, that's why you have to have one of these leavening agents. You've got to think about which one you're going to use. If you use baking soda, baking powder, it's the, it's the carbon dioxide that's doing the work. Doing the work. <coughs> and the, the last one is yeast, when we make yeast bread. Because what it is, the yeast produces carbon dioxide. So that's how we get the leavening agent, carbon dioxide. Okay? So we'll be talking about all of these products, all of these leavening, leavening agents in these products. And, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Coming up. Coming up. You're just ahead of the game for me. <laughs> You're coming up. Very good question. Okay. Uh, you know, that's always a difficulty with an average person, usually a homemaker. They don't know what the difference is. And this is why when you sometimes take the homemade cookie, you eat it. Up. <laughs> what did you put in it? Okay. Let you follow recipe. If you don't know it, follow recipe. Unless if you're a professional, you know what you're doing. Baking soda. Baking soda. I don't expect you to know chemical structures. It's not in the class. But it looks like this, mainly because sometimes it makes more sense if you see the chemical structure. Okay. Or it's the same as sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate. And it's alkaline in nature. It's not acid. It's alkaline in nature. It's an alkaline compound. What it does is it produces carbon dioxide. When it's heated up in liquid, in the mixture, with water, some liquid, and some leavening agent, sugar, whatever you have, it's going to give you, give off the carbon dioxide. So the process looks like this. Sodium bicarbonate plus heat gives you sodium carbonate and carbon dioxide with, with a leavening agent. What is a leavening agent here? CO2. Okay, so when it's being baked, the air, the COT, CO2, okay, is given off and it makes the product pour or rises, the product will rise as a result of the leavening agent, which really, in reality, is carbon dioxide and, of course, a little bit of water. Okay. The problem with baking soda coming from Samantha? Okay. Uh, good question. The, pro the problem with baking, because her question is, how can you tell the difference? What is the difference between baking soda and baking powder coming up? The problem with baking soda is that when you have this process, when you put baking soda in it, the baking, I mean, the sodium carbonate, which is this, sodium carbonate has a very disagreeable flavor. It tastes soapy. It tastes so soapy that you don't want to eat it. I've, I've eaten cookies that somebody has made, and I tasted it. I said, uh-oh. Like what you said, what's the difference, you know? What did, did you know the difference when she was baking it? Probably didn't. When it said, ask for baking powder, she probably used baking soda. Because if you use baking soda alone, it's 
what are you going to get? You're going to get the soap that tastes to it. You don't want to eat it. It tastes awful. It's a so it has a soapy residue. To avoid this, we have to combine it with an acid. Because the acid will combine with the baking soda to release the carbon dioxide. And what kind of acid do we use? We have some natural acid. If the recipe calls for cranberry juice, cranberry, molasses, brown sugar, buttermilk, and sour, we have a lot of fruit juice, honey, vinegar, any of the acidy ingredients that you add to it will be fine. Because then you have acid and alkali together to form salt, which is okay. Does not have salty taste. <coughs> and sugar and water. So if a recipe has some acid to it, like buttermilk, pancakes, I love buttermilk pancakes, actually it's a very good leavening agent. What it is, they use the acid from buttermilk and they use baking soda. That's all they use. Combination of two gives them carbon dioxide and there's no soapy taste. Acid and alkali gives you salt. So when you have baking soda with an acid, then you don't have a problem because you form salt. So why don't we put a, why don't we put an acid in the baking soda? If you put cream of tartar, which is an acid, in with the baking soda, then you've got an acid, an alkali. For those who have taken chemistry, an acid and an alkali forms what? Salt and what? Water, which is okay. The salt just gives a little salt taste to it, which is okay. But there's no soapy taste. Because the soapy taste came from what? From sodium carbonate, which we don't want. So the only way to avoid it, if you want to use baking soda, is when you have acid, fruit juice or something, cranberry or something. Then you could use baking soda itself, which is baking soda. That's what we use actually in the, some people put it there too, it absorbs odor, you know that? They put it in the refrigerator a lot. But it's typically an alkali. You cannot use it by itself. You've got to have an acid in it. <coughs> Otherwise, you can't eat it because you cannot eat it by itself. You don't take that, mmm, sticky like soap in your mouth. I don't know whether you've ever encountered that. I have, because I knew what I was tasting. And when I asked, when I asked the guests, what did you use? You said, oh, I ran out of baking soap, baking powder, so I use baking soda. Isn't it the same? Well, let's see. That's what baking powder is. Don't worry about the soap you play. I have cream of powder introduced, it's already in there. So the acid is already in the product. Baking soda and cream of tartar together. Look, this is baking soda, alkali, and this is cream of tartar, which is an acid. It forms a salt, potassium tartar, a salt, which is okay, a salt. Tastes a little salty, a little bit, that's all. Doesn't matter, doesn't hurt it. It's not the soapy taste. It's not the soapy taste. So, not objection. It's a salt not objectionable. And then you've got carbon dioxide and water, which water is okay. Carbon dioxide is what? What is the carbon dioxide as what? Leavening agent. Carbon dioxide is a leavening agent. Right? So, which is perfect. So, if you were to do any baking, if you have a recipe that does not have any acid, you, no acid in the recipe, what kind of leavening agent would you use? No acid. Did you, would you use baking soda or baking powder? Which is this one. Baking powder or baking soda. When there's no acid in it. Good. Baking powder because it already has an acid in it. You don't have to worry about it. So there's no soapy taste. That's 
stony face that results from baking soda alone. It's very objectionable. Okay? Do you want me to go over again? Huh? You understand? Yeah. Oh, maybe a couple people at the back might not. Baking soda alone like this cannot be used as a leavening agent by itself unless you have an acid to neutralize it. Cannot be used by itself. Otherwise, by itself, look, you're going to get sodium carbonate. It tastes very soapy. tastes awful. You ruin the whole batch of cookies. Okay? So by looking at the recipe, you know, or by tasting the cookie, you know whether the person who baked it made it knew what geo he was doing. Okay? So if you have no acid ingredients in it, just use baking powder because it already has baking soda and cream of tartar already in it. Okay? Any questions? Let's try. Okay, so everything. They all baking powders are baking soda plus an acid in big bold writing. All right? <clears throat> okay, so what sometimes you see the word double acting. What does it mean? Now it's going to get a little complicated. It's a baking powder, not a baking soda. But it's double acting. What does it mean? Double acting. Baking powder, we already know, releases carbon dioxide. Okay. But double acting is it's a two step process. When you mix the dry ingredients, the flour, sugar, and all that, in with liquid, once you get it wet, the carbon dioxide already comes off. You already have the leavening ingredients. <laughs> How many make cake? You see the bubbles already starting to form inside. So that's the first stage. That's why it's called double acting. That's the first acting. Once the liquid is combined with the powder, carbon dioxide already is formed. Now, when, now the second step is when you put it in the oven, then heat is applied then more carbon dioxide is going to come out. So it comes out in two different stages. So you've got to be careful. So this is why it's called double acting. That means they don't want to wait. It's a, it's a good way to do this because they want to get it going first by the room temperature. So you put it in the oven, the second step comes in, and you, that's why it's double acting. Mm -hmm. yeah. When would you use double acting? When would you... Uh, when would you use the double acting? That's all you have. I'm glad you asked that question. Look, clabber girl. Is that what you use? The clabber girl sometimes? I've used it before. You used it before? It says double acting. Okay. Basically, that's all, that's all you could find. Sometimes you cannot find anything else because that's what, you, that's what they recommend because it gives you the best product. The two-step process. Some carbon dioxide comes out at the beginning, and then the second part of carbon dioxide comes out. So the double acting is the best. Okay. And, okay, take a look at this recipe for me, if you would. Applesauce cranberry, cranberry bread. Okay, can you tell me what is the the leavening agent there. I already have it in red. Baking soda. Why do they use baking soda? Because there's already an acid there. What kind of acid is already there? Hmm? Cranberries. Correct. The cranberries are already acidy. So you don't want to be doubled, doubled up. You don't want to have another big already there is simplistic acid and this they neutralize each other. Is there anything else? No. Now sometimes they have just a little bit of cranberries. Not enough. A little bit of cranberry. Then you could have baking soda, maybe less baking soda, and you could have the rest of it could be baking powder if you want. So you can have a combination of baking soda and baking powder 
coming up as an example. Carrot cake. Take a look. What are the lovely agents here? Baking soda and baking powder. Why is that? They have both. Is there any acid ingredient in here? Which one has, it's closer to an acid, not really a big acid addition, but it's somewhat acidy. Yeah? What does the baking powder have acid? Uh, baking powder, yeah, it by itself is neutralized by itself. But I'm talking about food ingredients. What ingredient is there? Is there a cranberry or, you know, uh, like buttermilk? You know for sure buttermilk is very sour. All they need is just a little bit of baking powder, baking soda, that would do it. But what this, is there any acid in the rest of the ingredients? Yeah. Hmm? Okay. How about, it's not very much raw, they have some shredded, a lot of raw carrots. It's not much at all. So if they were to use some baking soda to neutralize this, it's not enough because it's a little bit of acidity. So the rest of it, they still need this baking powder to be used as a leavening agent. So sometimes you see chocolate, but sometimes you see molasses. They just a little bit acid, that's all. So they need a little bit of soda, baking soda to neutralize that. The rest, they still need baking powder by itself. So this is where the difference is from this recipe to the other. For buttermilk pancakes, I could tell you, it is so sour, do you need any baking powder? No. All you need is just a little bit of baking soda, that's all you need, because it's so sour. You see it right away. And already it rises so well. I love buttermilk pancakes because look at it. The volume is so much better than the regular pancakes. Maybe it's just maybe it's because of the buttermilk is sour. all the volume and the leavening agent together. Let's see. Okay, we're almost done. So you have any questions from before? Le leavening agents and all that? So what we're gonna be doing uh, in the next few weeks is that we're gonna do quick breads next. The easiest uh, breads, muffins, pancakes, popovers and biscuits. And then we're going to do pastry. And uh, so next week, we still have one more lab, Mila lab, of milk and egg product. And, but um, you'll be, we're going to have a fun class because we're going to make some angel food cake and sponge cake. And I'll bring some cream in. I did talk to Emil that, about that and some strawberries to make it, you know, uh, a dessert session. Um, so that will be the second uh, meal and lab class. And then we're going to go into this. So the first class will be on quick breads and pastries. The second meal and lab is going to be cakes and yeast bread. You know, the class is coming to the end almost. And after that, it's only going to be meats. <laughs> Time has gone by so fast. All right, so uh, ingredients. Okay, we already talked about that. Okay, so when we uh, do all different kinds of baking, uh, I hope when there, there will be instructions of beating, when it says beating, what does it mean? Basically, vigorously agitating food. When it says blending, basically mixing, blending, mixing, and just evenly distributed. Cleaning, when you use a mixer, electric mixer, combining vigorously, whipping, the sugar, sugar, <coughs> sugar in with the fat, such as making cakes. Uh, cutting, cutting will be cutting fat into it, such as uh, making pastry. Initial step is to cut fat into the flour. Folding, like um, when you work with the egg whites, and how do you fold some of the dry ingredients into whipped egg whites? Kneading will be kneading at hard to do the yeast bread.
sifting, sifting, of course, we already know that, how to sift through blood to demonstrate it. Stirring will be <coughs> gently mixing and whipping where it is needed. So these are the, the terms that you'll be, uh, the recipe you'll be using when we do all the baking. And uh, let me see, uh, why is bread flour, I just had some, if I had extra time, I was going to do, why is bread flour used for bread? Bread flour, what does it have that other flour does not have? Protein. protein. Yeah, because you want the gluten density. That's why the more protein you have, the more kneading. We'll talk about that. Today. Why is cake flour uh, used for cake? Because it has more what? It has less protein and more starch. That's why it's very tender. Okay. You can bite into it. You don't have to chew it at all. It melts in your mouth. Uh, baking soda should not be used as a leavening agent without an acid. Why? You should know that. I'm about to test you on that because it tastes soapy otherwise. What is baking powder? Baking powder is baking soda plus already an acid, which they already put in, which is cream of tartar. And what is double acting? But double acting, most of them are double acting now. All of the baking powder you buy, but basically, uh, practically everything, because it is better for the process to start. That's why when you do the baking, don't wait for long. Because when you have everything mixed, sometimes you wait. I see somebody look, leave it on the side for half an hour before you put it in the oven. A lot of gas has already come up. No, don't wait for so long because the process has already begun. You should put it into the oven as soon as we can. Okay? And that's it for the class. Any questions? So, um, let me see. Next, we have two weeks of milk and egg. Okay. Oh, we have two. This week, sorry, we have two online quizzes. Two online quizzes. Okay. We didn't have any last week, so you did get a big break last week. So this week we have two online quizzes. But whenever you have a lab, you have a lab report. And also for those who, uh, you know, I, I realize that I've been marking students' papers. If I had any com comments, I always put comments in, <coughs> in the report so that you know what you did wrong. Like if you didn't get 10 out of 10, it's because you didn't have the two or three scientific principles I asked for. And if you get, didn't get 10 out of 10, that means you're missing something. You didn't cite the references or you didn't. Some students are very good. You have references and you cite. Because originally in the course syllabus, I just said cite references, so I'm very lax about it. And so although that is actually the core of your, of your homework, is to cite scientific principles behind it. Now, in your own notes, you could always cite me if you want. In my notes, okay, you could say, this is a function of this, and this is why we do this. This is a function of this. That's why we do it. It's all in our notes. But I ask for two references because I want you to know, as other than my own notes, my own class, i like you to know how to cite a different book or, or periodical, or whatever you use, but use something else. You can always use brown if you want. The purpose is for you to learn how to do the references, how to cite it, okay? So all the materials, just based on my material, you can find two or three already scientific prints because I explained it in detail. So all of you should be able to get 10 out of 10, but I found that some of the students continue to get seven out of 10, seven out of 10, because they didn't have this, they didn't have this. And each time make a comment. And one student told me, maybe you didn't know, do you know how to check the comments that we make? Oh, is this why? You, there's a, see, I don't see from students reports, so I don't know. If you click on it, on one of them, it says comments, that's what they said. I'm gonna have to go to the students' viewpoint to see how you could click. There is, you get to see our comments so that you don't make the same mistakes again. That's what I'm saying. There are several places where you could click. Just when you get your results, click on, I think it says comments, because that's where I usually 
Because I would not give you seven out of ten if I didn't have any reason, or eight out of ten. Otherwise, it'd be ten out of ten. Okay? Make sure so that you, you, you next time you do better. The other attendance sheet, I asked for the you could write so I get to know that uh, I get to know the name. So where's where the one? That uh, here. Maybe because then I know who's who. I, I was able to call out Samantha because I know who she is now. See, I always know you because you're my life, but now I don't know everybody here. That's why. Okay. You already did you sign up? You didn't. You better write it down. You name it. Because that's the attendance sheet. Oh, did you give it to me? I didn't see it. Oh, no, no, no. It's right here. I oh. just emailed you asking if I could meet with you really quick. You just have to. Um, okay. Kind of do, I, do I give it? Do, do you. Um, uh, I just have to check your grade and all that. So, could I give it to you next week? Oh, it's actually due tomorrow. That's why I wanted. Oh, okay. Then, uh, could you, could, would you give me?